If you remember on my first video, I said we really didn't know what happened during the Planck era. A lot of people seem to use this knowledge gap as a place to attack the Big Bang Theory, as if the facts we had already uncovered that verified the theory were somehow invalid because we didn't understand some aspect of the theory that didn't depend on these evidences. What I didn't say was that we had no idea as to what happened. In fact, cosmologists have plenty of ideas, for many decades, as to what happened during this era. The only reasons I didn't state this is because my video is solely an introduction and quantum gravity theories are certainly not introductory subjects. Also, I wanted to talk only about things that have been verified beyond reasonable doubt. While there are certain pieces of evidence to back up some Planck era ideas, nothing decisive has been found yet. This video is going to be devoted to explaining the basics of quantum gravitational theories, while the next video will be to explain how these are related to cosmology. Quantum gravity is a complicated subject and very difficult to understand conceptually. The mathematics required for even basic quantum mechanics classes entail an understanding of subjects like linear algebra and probability theory, while more in-depth versions require abstract algebra and other related fields. Quantum gravity is an attempt to merge quantum mechanics with our notion of gravity. The issue is this. Quantum mechanics provides physicists with explanations of the very small. It has successfully made sense of the subatomic and molecular world, and has been experimentally verified time and time again for a century, and to incredible accuracy. Likewise, Einstein's theory of general relativity has successfully explained the realm of the very massive. It too has been tested time and time again for the better part of a century, and also to incredible accuracy. For most regions of our universe, heavy masses aren't really concentrated into a small enough region to warrant an explanation from both quantum mechanics and general relativity. However, such regions do exist, and as things currently stand now, the merger doesn't turn out very well, each providing us with a different answer which conflicts with the answer of the other theory. For instance, let's take a black hole singularity. General relativity has no problem with singularities and tells us that this exists inside of the event horizon of a black hole. Quantum mechanics, on the other hand, doesn't allow for us to pinpoint locations of particles in such absolute exact fashion. Thus, any particle swept into the singularity could be located at just one given point and would instead be spread out over a small but non-zero size region. Basically, inside of a black hole we either have a singularity or we don't have a singularity. It all depends on what theory you use. But these are both well tested and well verified theories, so how do we merge them if they conflict? The answer is that neither of these theories takes into account the effects of the other one because they aren't really necessary most of the time. The theories both work in their respective realms, but are open to tweaking when we apply them to unfamiliar territory, like the singularity of black hole or the Big Bang singularity. We will be taking a look at two prominent theories of quantum gravity, explaining the basics. I will be explaining the basic physics involved, and later we will be seeing how these apply to cosmology. I want everyone to keep in mind that these explanations are going to be very simplistic. Part of that is so that you, the listener, can understand what I'm talking about. The other part is that, despite the fact that I am an aspiring physicist, to even have a basic feel for this sort of subject, I'm going to need to be spending a lot of time as a graduate student studying this sort of stuff. I simply am not capable, as a junior year physics undergrad, to provide sufficient detail about quantum gravitational theories to constitute a thorough explanation. So, with that disclaimer out of the way, let's first discuss a lesser known but very strong competitor with string theory, loop quantum gravity, which I'll, here, hereafter I'll call this LQG for short. In order for any idea to be even considered as a theory of quantum gravity, it must first meet some requirements made of it by general relativity and quantum mechanics. After all, we're trying to merge these two ideas, we're going to have to have some restrictions on quantum gravity made by these two original ideas. For instance, relativity requires any theory of quantum gravity to be background independent. This means that any fields our theory talks about, for instance a gravitational field in this case, these cannot depend on any given coordinate system. So if I change my coordinate system, the idea would still remain the same. Nothing physical about the system would change. This is the notion of background independence. Now various other invariances are required, but the detail is really beyond the scope of this video, again, mostly because I just don't understand the mathematics behind these invariances. So what does the approach of LQG say about gravity? Well, LQG, like general relativity, turns gravity into a problem of geometry. 
However, this geometry is very different looking from the simple bowling ball on the mattress model that everyone is so familiar with with relativity. Instead, LQG takes advantage of objects, mathematical objects, called manifolds, which can be related to just plain old Euclidean space in a certain mathematical context. This is the type of space we make use of in our everyday high school geometry classes. In the context of these manifolds, we can define various spin networks, another kind of buzzword in loop quantum gravity. Uh, spin networks are just ways of describing possible quantum states of our system. Well, that's nice. Uh, what is a quantum state? A quantum state is something that just tells us what condition our system is in. For instance, if I had a ball and told you it was sitting at position x at time t, this would be the state the ball is in. We know everything about the ball now, assuming it's just a point. Well, a similar notion holds for what a quantum state is. LQG describes the spin networks of a gravitational field, which makes sense because we're trying to figure out quantum gravity, quantum mechanically. One neat result of LQG is something known as the Emirzi parameter, which provides physicists with a way to talk about the smallest possible size in our universe. This smallest possible size, while astronomically tiny, is not zero and thus would clear up many problems with the singularities proposed by general relativity. This would also clear up our, our singularity within the Big Bang, which is the source of most of the problems with the early eras of the Big Bang Theory. But let's move on to the much more popular string theory. Now string theory gained much fame due to the physicist Brian Greene's book, The Elegant Universe. In fact, I'd say string theory had, pretty much owes all of its popularity to Brian Greene. And that's, his books actually are what got me into wanting to study quantum gravity, so thank you, Brian Greene. Fortunately, due to the existence of this non-technical literature on the subject, string theory has become much easier to understand conceptually because those who know it better than, say, I do, for instance, every other, every other quantum physicist out there, uh, fortunately we have one of them who's written a popular account of the theory for lay people like everyone else to grasp. Now, string theory takes a different approach to the problem of quantum gravity than LQG does. In LQG, the background of space was described using the mathematical idea of spin networks within a manifold. In string theory, in a very small scale, the geometry of space on the quantum level cannot even be described most of the time, a possible implication being that space on the most fundamental scale doesn't have any geometrical description, but that order only arises on larger scales. In this larger playing field of the universe, we have objects called strings, which, depending on the energy at which they resonate, could be any of the particles that exist within our universe. However, like LQG, string theory prohibits singularities from popping up in reality. This is due to the finite nature of the string itself. The length of a string is not zero, and it's discrete, which means we cannot shrink it down any further than the size it's at. So, the universe can collapse to a very small size, but it can't get any smaller than a string, otherwise we'd have a string just existing in no space. It, the idea doesn't make any sense. So, the universe has to at least be as big as a string in string theory. So, while LQG, loop quantum gravity, and string theory are two different approaches to the same problem, one thing is clear, and this we will make use of in our next video. Singularities have got to go. This isn't due to some fudging by the physicist to make things work out. It's something that comes right out of the mathematics inherent in our universe. And fortunately, this has many profound applications, as we will see next time.